Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our fifth Date Divides event, Getting Things Done with Data in Government. My name is Gavin Freegard, Programme Director here at the Institute for Government for Data and Digital Government, and it's wonderful to see so many of you seeking solace in data tonight. Um, I, I, it's been two months since our, our last event, and I know at a time of political crisis, it's quite nice to feel the warming embrace of a much-loved institution returning after a short break. <laughs> Um, hands up if you've been to Data Bytes before. Welcome back. Hands up if it's your first time. Welcome. Hopefully we'll give you a great show tonight and you'll want to be putting your hands up as a returnee next time round. Um, first off, some housekeeping about tonight's event. We are on the record and we are being live streamed, so hello to anybody watching us at home. The hashtag, if you'd like to get involved on Twitter, is hashtag IFGDataBytes and you can follow us on at IFGEvents. And for those of you in the room, you can get on the Wi-Fi. The network is IFG Guest. The username is IFG, and the password is Visitor. So, since we last met on the 3rd of July, not much has happened, really, has it? It's been pretty quiet. I mean, there was enough time for a final record-breaking ministerial resignation under Theresa May. This is the chart you've come to know and love. Um, number 36 was Margot James, uh, as you can see that line going up there on the 18th of July. So there was, there was that. Um, there were a couple of government defeats that day as well, in Parliament and in the Commons. And also that same day, we bid farewell to Sir Jonathan Thompson, the uh, Permanent Secretary of HMRC, announced that he'd be leaving. He's on the sort of sixth line down there. Um, and you can see from that chart of permanent secretaries, a lot of green showing all of the men, not so much purple apart from DEFRA showing all of the women. So a chance to address the balance later this year when that appointment is made. So there was, there was that, I suppose. I mean, the Lib Dems appointed a new leader, Joe Swinson. Um, you can see right down at the bottom, um, actually one of the bigger victories since Paddy Ashdown uh, back in 1988. Then, of course, the Conservatives appointed a new leader as well. Um, that's showing you what happens all the way through the different balloting uh, processes. Um, interesting to see Boris Johnson actually leading in every single ballot. That's not something that happens very often uh, in Tory party leadership contests. The favourite usually doesn't get all the way. So then, of course, a new Tory leader, a new Prime Minister. That meant a new government uh, needed to be formed. And, of course, even before he started, quite a few, those sort of pink... Uh, boxes that you can see there had already resigned or said they weren't going to, to serve in the new government. I mean, you can see Philip Hammond, David Gork, Rory Stewart, whatever happened to them. <laughs> it was actually quite a ruthless um, reshuffle when it came as well. And this chart is showing you what happened in sort of previous comparable transitions of Prime Minister from Thatcher to Major Blair to Brown, Cameron to May. And if you look at the left-hand side of the line, those sort of dark grey boxes show you how many people were ejected from Cabinet altogether. The May-Johnson transition was actually the most uh, sort of ruthless in doing that. And actually a lot of the people who were coming into Cabinet roles were new to their posts. Actually quite a lot of change there as well. Of course, that reshuffle went on for about a week. So that sort of gets us to the end of July, beginning of August. Then there was the Brecon and Radnorshire by-election, where the government's majority fell a little bit further as the Lib Dems gained the seat. Then the Prime Minister decided he'd announced he was going to prorogue Parliament, so there was that. Then, of course, 36 days into the new administration, George Young decided that he would become the first ministerial resignation under Boris Johnson. Again, there is the old chart with May, and if you keep your eye peeled on the bottom corner, you can see Johnson just poking up there 36 days in. Blair lost a minister after two days, incidentally, so it's not a record by some distance. So there was all of that, and then, of course, there was yesterday. Um, yet another government defeat, which had quite an impact on the uh, composition of the House of Commons. Um, so this is what the Commons looked like uh, after the 2017 general election. You can see the Tories just able to govern with the support of those dark brown DUP boxes there in the middle. Now, keep an eye on the middle there, because even yesterday morning, the situation was quite different from after the election. Various defections and suspensions, Change UK, the independent group, whatever they're calling themselves now, um, and various other sort of people going independent, meant that it already looked quite different from the election. But then, of course, we had Philip Lee defecting uh, from, to the Liberal Democrats and the withdrawal of the whip from 21 Conservative MPs, which means 
That is now what the House of Commons looked like. Um, that 21-strong uh, group, actually the fourth largest bloc in Parliament overnight. <laughs> and all of that means that the government has rather lost its majority. Um, from 14 uh, after the June 2017 election, down to minus 41 as of now. And this may have changed in the last half an hour or so, um, following yet another vote. So apart from that, nothing has changed. We've also done quite a lot with data over the summer. We put together a joint letter with various civil society groups uh, on the national data strategy. Uh, my colleagues working on our performance tracker project were looking at various public services before the spending review today, so do check that out on our website. And later this week, our parliamentary monitor team, who've been waiting for the data releases as Parliament finally comes to a close, um, they're releasing a mini version of parliamentary monitor, um, taking a data-informed approach to what's been going on. So, that's later this week, but what about tonight? Um, why are we doing this? Why do we hold data bytes? Well, um, we want to bring different data communities across government and outside government together. We want to show leaders what better data could achieve. And we want to put best practice and interesting projects on the record. So, how does tonight's event work? Well, you're going to hear four presentations on data projects. Each speaker will have eight minutes to present. That is just eight minutes. Uh, there are eight bits in a byte, hence there are eight minutes in a data byte. And if you look over there, you can see that the countdown timer is really counting down quite quickly in front of uh, Equifax, who are kindly supporting tonight's event, their banner. Um, so there'll be eight minutes for each speaker. There'll then be eight minutes of questions. And again, we will set the time running as soon as the first question is asked. Um, and then we'll move on to the next speaker. So four presentations, each of eight minutes, followed by eight minutes of questions from you. Um, this is our fifth event, so we've already had Data Bytes 1, Data Bytes 2, 20 fantastic presentations already. Actually, no, it'll be 20 after tonight, won't it? It'd be helpful if I could count, given this is all about numbers. <laughs> um, but we've already had 16 amazing speakers. Um, tonight's lineup also promises to be a blockbuster. First, we'll be hearing from Ollie Vogel, who's the head of recovery performance at Indessa, talking about identifying sort of vulnerable users in uh, public services. Then we'll hear from Dr. Emma Gordon, who's leading the um, Administrative Data Research UK project. Full disclosure, I'm on the research commissioning board for that. We'll then hear from Graham Thompson, program director for counter fraud at the Cabinet Office, talking about how to use data to deal with public sector fraud. And finally, we'll have Sam Tazziman from the MOJ talking about a rather big subject, the future of data at the MOJ. A date for your diaries. We'll be back on the 2nd of October, sponsorship permitting. If you'd like to pitch a presentation, you can email me. If you'd be interested in supporting the series, like Equifax kindly are tonight, please do get in touch with david.repepi-lewis at instituteforgovernment.org.uk. And... Bang on the zero. Um, it's my pleasure to hand over to our first speaker this evening, Ollie. Thank you, Gavin. Hi. I'd like to take a bit of a detour from Westminster politics uh, and instead talk to you today about financial vulnerability in government debt and specifically what we in Indessa are doing to use data and analytics to identify vulnerable customers. Um, the topic of vulnerability, I'm sure, won't be a new one to anyone in the room, and you may even recognize some of the quotes on the wall behind me. They represent a fraction of what regulators, government departments, and industry are saying about vulnerability. Working in the debt industry, as I do, puts us very close to vulnerable customers. And I describe it as we have a high likelihood of interacting with these customers, as well as a high risk of detriment if we're not working in the right way. But our position also gives us a tremendous opportunity to affect some real change. So before I go any further in the presentation, I just want to give a bit of background on who Indessa are and what we do. So Indessa are a joint venture between TDX Group, a private sector debt specialist, and the Cabinet Office. We were set up in 2015, and since then, we've been providing a wide range of debt management services to government and to the wider public sector. Okay. Our approach, if you like, to debt resolution can be simplified into the following four stages. So 
Firstly, a government department will pass us a file of uh, in-depth customers. Secondly, we'll use a range of data sources to enrich that file, understand that customer circumstances and what the most appropriate treatment path is to resolve their debt. Thirdly, it'll be, the customers will be passed to one of our panel of debt collection agencies to execute that strategy, which will lead to resolution of the debt. To date, most of our effort in vulnerability and addressing vulnerability has been focused on this part and uh, for good reason because this is where collections agents working on our behalf actually interact with customers. But the challenge for me and for my team was what can we do with data to drive better interactions and hence better outcomes for vulnerable customers. Can we do anything? And because I'm a strong believer in the power of data I said yes of course we can do something here. And the kind of, the seed of an idea in my head was, surely we must be able to use data and intelligence to identify customers that we believe are vulnerable. And if we could do that, then what different treatment paths can we design that are better suited to those customers' needs? So to start to turn that intention into some results, we did a lot of research, a lot of reading. And one of the things we found was this from the, uh, the, the four um, characteristics of potential vulnerability uh, that the FCA talk about in a number of their publications. And looking at this, what we quickly realized is that we have a lot more data on these two characteristics than we do on these two. And so in order to deliver a data-led solution, we decided to focus on financial capability and financial resilience. And so when you hear me talking about financial vulnerability, is those two characteristics in particular I'm talking about. Okay. So we have the challenge. We've now got the scope. What we need to do is crack on and build a model, right? Well, the slight challenge is that when we look at our historic data that we typically use to build a model, we don't know exactly who's vulnerable and who's not. And the reason we don't is because we don't speak to every customer. In fact, the research tells us we're less likely to speak to vulnerable customers than we are other customers. So for you uh, model build enthusiasts out there, what that means is we don't have a really crisp dependent variable. So we can't use regression techniques, for instance, to build a model. So what did we do instead? So we went back to the data. The team scoured over 150 credit bureau characteristics to identify links between those data points and financial vulnerability. And they did so with their experience and knowledge and also the data points we do have available. Contacts, vulnerability, where we have identified it, as well as some department-specific data points. And what they found was these six behaviours that we think show a sign, show indication of financial vulnerability. So the first, poor management of the basics, is a really good example of how we can use data to identify financial capability specifically. So an example of that is an individual who might use an overdraft for relatively low value borrowing, right? particularly where that's an unauthorized overdraft use, and particularly where they have other cheaper options available. Secondly, high utilization of credit points very clearly to low financial resilience. For instance, a customer who's at or above the credit limit across their credit cards. So I won't speak in detail about the other four behaviours, apart from to say that we've got a really good balance, I think, of leading indicators that show how a customer is behaving in the present and how that links to vulnerability, as well as lagging indicators, so an indication of what someone's done in the past that points to their likelihood of vulnerability in the present. From these behaviours, the team defined 18 signals of financial vulnerability. So 18 specific examples of those behaviours that we coded up and then set a threshold where when we see three or more of these sig signals, we will, in this model, define that individual as financially vulnerable. And after creating this, the question for me was, and the slightly nerve-wracking question is we couldn't use standard model build techniques, was how well does this work? What kind of customers might this model identify? 
Um, I've not got a ton of time to show lots of uh, uh, analyses or charts, but I just want to show four numbers that I think answer that question. So this model identifies 5% of a typical debt portfolio as being financially vulnerable. We are 60% less likely to speak to customers in that segment. They are 80% less likely to make a payment. And when we look at liquidation rates, so the proportion of the debt that's paid back, that's 90% lower. Or we put it another way, we're less likely to speak to these customers. The ones that we do speak to are less likely to pay, and the ones that do pay can only pay back less. So I think that tells me that we're onto something with this model. But how do we use it? So I'm super excited to put this model to use in our collection strategies. But of course, it's not just the model and the segmentation that's important. It's the collection strategy that we pair with that that's really key. And we currently have a tender in the market to identify those suppliers who can deliver that right treatment path for this customer group. Even while that work is going on, the team is super excited about where we go next with this, with the, with the model build specifically. And for me, the biggest opportunity is to broaden out the model to include all four characteristics of vulnerability, looking at data on health and major life events. So very sensitive data sets. And I think, therefore, the, the challenge for us is how do we use that data, those various data sources, in a way that's legal, in a way that's ethical, and in a way that genuinely improves outcomes for financially vulnerable customers. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ollie. Um, so, we are on the record uh, for questions, so please do be aware of that. If you give your name um, and where you're from and keep your sort of questions nice and short, because I will start the timer as soon as the first question is asked, uh, we will try to take questions in groups of two or three. So, any questions for Ollie? We've got one down the front here. Oh, we've got one at the back there. Uh, let's start with those two. Okay, thanks. Uh, Julie Pierce from the Food Standards Agency. So um, we have a hypothesis um, that for food businesses, where particularly where they're SMEs, um, there's a correlation um, between poor financial performance as a lead indicator for poor food safety performance. Mm. And I'm just wondering whether you would be interested in exploring that hypothesis with us. Thank you. And then at the back, and if you could wait for the mics to come to you if you'll ask a question. Hi there, my name is Bradley Carter Roberts from the Treasury. I just wanted to ask whether you could uh, give some examples of some of the treatment packages that you refer to, uh, just to help me understand. Thank you. Thank you. And was it Julie? Yes. Julie. Um, so, yes, absolutely, we'd be interested in exploring where we can use data to uh, identify you know, department specific concerns like, uh, like food standards. We think there's great crossover um, where I think the point you're making, if I may paraphrase, is that data in one area can be really helpful for another. Um, we are, I think, as an organization, um, don't think we are advocates of, of data sharing where that's of benefit to departments. So yes, that would be something that we're very interested in. Um, and I'm really sorry, was it Paddy or? Bradley. Bradley, yes. Bradley sorry. Um, Bradley, uh, your question was around examples of treatment paths. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, uh, eight minutes is a very short time to get a presentation to, so uh, that's something I had to drop out. Um, we've, as I say, we've launched a tender into the market for suppliers to, to give us what they think the strategy should be. Uh, we are keen to listen to the market and hear what, what their ideas are. But of course, we're going into that tender with an idea of the, the rough size and shape of what we think the right answer should be. And I'll give you a few, um, let me give you probably three categories of where we'll be looking for what we think that right answer is. Um, the first category is in the commercial model. Uh, most of the uh, debt industry, um, or the, the, the received wisdom in the debt industry is to work on a commission basis where the uh, agencies get paid as a percentage of collections. Um, which has a lot of pros, has some cons, particularly when we're dealing with vulnerable customers, though, that doesn't feel like the right model at all. So we're looking for some kind of alternative model there. Secondly, um, the look and feel of the communications is a really key factor. 
So we've had some really interesting, or heard some really interesting results in using uh, wording in the letters that is around, I want to speak to you. I want to understand your circumstances, as opposed to letters that are written in the form of, she, you've missed this payment, can you please pay? And, uh, not saying those letters are wrong, but you need to get the right letter to the right customer's circumstance. Uh, and I said three areas. So the third area is around the, um, the kind of length of strategy. So again, one of the conventions in the debt industry is that um, there's a certain amount of time within which we can resolve that customer situation. When that time elapses, it, it's elapsed. But when we're dealing with customers who have very complex uh, situations that we need time to understand, those time limits start to make a bit less sense. And so we'll be looking for suppliers to show an understanding of how that can be varied and how, that can, uh, how those time limits can be um, suited to, to the individual circumstance. Next set of questions. Uh, we've got one over there. And we've got one down here. Any others? We might have time for another round. Great. Thanks for the presentation. Really fascinating to hear about a great use of data to make people's lives better. <laughs> um, you said that there were four characteristics of data vulnerability, but have majored on two. So I wonder if you could comment on the virtues and validity of the models that come when you're ignoring two significant characteristics. And in particular, whether the six, uh, what was it, six behaviors, that's the language you used, uh, yes. can be used as proxies for the two things that you're um, uh, overlooking in any sense. Okay, thank you. And then down here in the third row. Uh, yeah, Paul Daly, GBG. Uh, having worked with you guys, I know you do quite a lot in this area. It was just interesting on the um, six characteristics from the 150 sets and credit data. I just thought, looking at vulnerable customers, have you thought about using data other than credit? Things like transactional data, purchase data, retail data, mobile phone data. So a lot of those people may not have a credit footprint mm -hmm. or a poor credit footprint. So it'd be useful to know what other data other than credit you guys might look at. Great, thank you. Data. Um, I'm really sorry I didn't catch your name at the start of that. Sorry, yes, I didn't. I realized it was uh, Joe Baker from Kimberley. Joe, hi, thank you uh, for your question. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great point. Um, the FCA talk about these four characteristics of potential vulnerability. Yeah, we focused on only two. That feels like a bit of a gap. Um, I, I've stylized them as four boxes because um, it goes with our PowerPoint theme. Um, if you look at the FCA's uh, uh, publications on the topic, they do a very amazing four way Venn diagram showing that from their research there's, there's huge overlap as you'd probably expect from customers that might have had major life events, um, health and, and, and therefore uh, financial resilience and, and capability. Um, and so when you look at that Venn diagram, I've not got the stats exactly in my head, but covering the, the two financial characteristics gives us a very uh, uh, more than 50% coverage of, of customers who in the FCA's research they're identified as vulnerable. Um, so I'd say that we do have some visibility of, of those other two characteristics as my first point. But there will be some customers who, who we're missing. I say customers, I come from a private sector background, service users uh, is maybe the, 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 the correct term, uh, who we may be missing. And I think, as to my point uh, right at the end of the presentation there, I think that is a gap that it would be really exciting to try and fill. Um, I know um, that... Um, you know, cracks have been trying to work with um, uh, charities to identify if there's a way to, to opt in to share your data that you might be um, you know, un undergoing a health, serious health issue or, or major life event that can be used to your benefit, for instance, holding your out of debt collection activities as well as other uses. So I definitely see that as a kind of version two uh, improvement. Uh, Paul, um, thank you for your question. Um, I think it kind of uh, links um, to the previous question in that there are other sources of data out there that we um, would like to use. Um, so I think you're absolutely right to identify those, those categories where we could build that understanding. M my rough perspective on this is I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of you know, putting something live and, and uh, learning from that. So while the model doesn't cover the f all the bases we might like it to, be really interesting to put that live, communicate with those 5% of customers that are most at 
risk of vulnerability in a different way, see what conversations we have with them and learn from that, and for instance, what other data sources we can, we can take on board. So again, a definite version two um, uh, uh, thing that we want to include. Fantastic. We've got 20 seconds left if anybody wants to get an incredibly <laughs> quick question. Very quick. Um, otherwise, I'll ask one very final one. Um, we ask our speakers some questions before um, they come on as well. If there's one thing you could change about government data, what would you, what would you do? <laughs> You've got five seconds. Uh, I think really quickly, uh, I think it comes back to Julie's question, um, making data sharing when it's for the benefit of the customer built in rather than a, a, a quite difficult thing to do afterwards. Be my one thing. Great. Ollie, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, thank you. And next we have from ADR UK, Emma. Hi. Thanks very much, uh, Gavin, for inviting me. Um, so I'm sure some of you in the room already know quite a lot about the Administrative Data Research UK programme, um, but today I'm going to be focusing on just uh, telling you why I think it's really important, this programme, and also why I think it's exactly the right time to do this, building on the previous investment that some of you might know, ADRN. So um, I think this quote from Hutton Shah sums up quite nicely one of the main reasons why we were funded over this period, uh, three year period, to do this work. So where everyone knows that government departments lead on certain policy areas, but where policies cross departmental boundaries or the d data to support policy making uh, evidence based decisions falls across different departments, it can be really difficult for one department to make it a priority to do all the data sharing agreements um, to, to actually collate that data, link it to inform policy. So that's why we're here. And that's also assuming that the data exists in the first place and that the department wanting to collate the data has the right infrastructure to build the data, curate it, look after it. and. Um, uh, give access to it to researchers. So if we just go on to talk a little bit about uh, what the ADR UK partnership is about, I'm the director of the strategic hub team which is based in ESRC um, and we've also got uh, partnerships right across all of the devolved administrations and these are partnerships between academics and um, government. And uh, that's really building on everything that did work in the previous ADRN investment when the devolved administrations quietly got on and really proved the value of evidence-based policy making using administrative data. And we're also um, funding the Office for National Statistics and they're a really, really key partner because we're funding the development of their secure research service. So that was previously uh, really restricted to just how to... Um, share access to ONS data, but we're funding them so that they can develop that service so it can be a service run on behalf of government. And if I just briefly talk about ADI UK's approach, so uh, we're funding uh, the work that needs to be done sometimes, as I explained before, before um, a data set can be cre uh, created. And um, if we go back to the June Data Bytes event, um, uh, Yvonne Gallagher from the National Audit Office summed this up really nicely because she said many departments are working with operational systems that were never designed to output data for research that could be linked to other data sets. So we're all assuming that this data exists and can be linked, but actually that's not always the case. So I'll give you a really good example of where we're working with the department to solve that kind of problem. And as well as providing secure research access services right across the UK um, for projects that support the public good, we're also funding research that's designed to inform policy. And uh, this is specifically at the moment just restricted to a few demonstrator projects where it's government telling us that this uh, project needs to happen. They want um, to link up with researchers to do it. But as more data sets become available, we are hoping to be able to do open calls so that uh, researchers more widely can bid for this type of uh, work. 
but fundamentally we're about uh, the um, curation of new linked data sets that have a life beyond just one project or one researcher. Now, um, this quote uh, from the National Audit Office kind of sums up quite nicely the level of ambition across ADI UK. Um, we know we can't do this across all policy areas and for every administrative data stream uh, within this investment period, but we hope, I think the time's right for us to be able to do this in a few key areas because we've got the Digital Economy Act now providing the permissive legal gateway. We've got the infrastructure across the UK to allow it to happen. And we've also crucially got the vision in key areas of government. So um, some of you will recognise this as a, an image that uh, kind of summarises the five safes which allow government to make uh, um, good decisions about use of data. I'm not going to go into this because that would be a whole uh, presentation in itself, but this is there to remind me to tell you these are the principles that we're working to right across the partnership, right across the UK. And this is really important because not only does it give government departments reassurance that we're handling data safely, but it's also something that academic researchers and researchers more widely understand, and crucially the public as well. So, um, when I talk about data sharing, we, we are only promoting data sharing between government departments and uh, the Office for National Statistics and, and uh, other, the devolved administrations. We're not talking about data sharing with researchers. So if you think about this in terms of a lending library where a librarian has to let a book go out of the building and then they've got no idea who's reading that book as soon as it goes out of the building. We're talking about a reading library where the person comes to the library to read and that material never goes out of the building in that form. And that's the type of service that this Five Saves allows us to build. So we've got a lot of different themes of work that we're building up uh, in this, the course of this investment. Some of these uh, are building on what happened in the previous investment and some of those are brand new. And I'll just briefly talk about a couple of those examples now. Um, so we're linking, uh, working with the Department for Education and ONS to link um, census data to educational attainment data. And these are examples of two data sets that already have a really good body of knowledge uh, built up around them that have supported policy development and wider research. And by linking them together, we hope that that can be strengthened through better understanding of the interplay between homes, households and educational attainment. And we're also working with the Children's Commissioner's Office to develop uh, new um, uh, definitions of vulnerability. And it's going to be all based around this work and building on this approach. Um, now, very exciting. Today we signed an agreement with the Ministry of Justice uh, for them to do some methodological work to understand whether they can link data across different uh, parts of the justice system, so civil, family and criminal, because they're in this situation where they've got 30 or 40 different administrative data feeds that can't easily be linked. And there's an awful lot of really useful understanding for the Ministry of Justice about how people move through these systems that they could do if they had access to this type of data. And um, just wanted to uh, finish by saying that this partnership is bringing government researchers and members of the public together to agree how data should be used safely and securely to support evidence-based policy making and wider research and please do check out our website um, there's an awful lot of information on there about what I've talked about today we released our first annual report today there's a copy on the website as well that um, is right up to date and uh, if you'd like to follow us on Twitter or uh, the website, the addresses are there. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, how will the people in the data sets know that this, these projects are being used and how will they be able to see what the results are? Thank you. And then we've got one in the second row down here. Luke Stamber, Civil Servant. As a data scientist in government, I think what you're doing is really important. So my question is really, how, what are the things that I can do to make your job easier? <laughs> Right. <laughs> and we've got one final question on the second row on the other side as well. Thank you. Hi, uh, Shabir from Cabinet Office. Um, so I think you briefly mentioned the Ministry of Justice and you've got a signed agreement and I think you talked about the different data sets that the Ministry of Justice has across different administrative areas. Could you maybe perhaps give us an example of the kind of questions you'd be able to answer or ask based on the Ministry of Justice and those data sets? Thanks. Thank you. Right, thanks very much for that. Uh, so, Sam, really good question about um, how members of the public are going to be involved in this work. Um, we are about to launch a, a big piece of work about public engagement, and that'll, we're not just doing that in isolation um, ourselves. So, building on the previous investment, the uh, devolved administrations already have public panels um, that um, they test their work on them before they go ahead and uh, we're also working with the other research councils around um, how to get um, sort of um, really informed advice from the public about how to take this work forward and just to make sure that everyone understands um, when we talk about data linkage and what uh, researchers will be able to access Everything that is available to researchers in the Secure Research Service, all the identifiers are already stripped out. And basically, it's against the law to then try and re-identify an individual um, from that data to go back. So we're, we're not interested in ADI UK about funding the operational use of data to go back to individuals. This is all about looking at, at population level data to be able to inform policies but i hope that covers no it doesn't okay <laughs> um well i'm sure we can talk later about that but yeah really like to hear your views on on that and definitely um carry on the conversation lewis you wanted to know what would make my job easier <laughs> um so i think in my experience, trying to do this work is, it's about, um, my job is about engaging government departments when they're really busy doing, you know, delivering policies, delivering services, all the rest of it, to demonstrate the value of this type of work. And uh, if there's people within departments that kind of understand that, then, you know, it's really good to be able to work with those people to, to kind of, um, come at it from both sides and that's really the, the Ministry of Justice project that I'm talking about that's been a collaboration like really over the last nine months about building up that kind of trust and understanding about what's possible and how the ONS system works how people develop it so it's really um, building that level of understanding up across government and I'm already doing a lot of that but you know anything that you can help you know spread the word basically and now we've got a website that's live it's much easier and and that's yeah then, then you've got something to point to to kind of introduce what we're doing and um should be you had a good question about ministry of justice and what types of questions they'd be able to um answer so this i mean it, it's exploratory work to start with um but the 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 way it was explained to me when we ha were having our first initial conversations with Ministry of Justice was that ideally the situation that they'd really like to be able to get to in you know kind of three years time is um, to be able to track how individuals end up coming to the justice systems and there's evidence in the academic literature that it's not just a kind of random scattering of people coming to different parts of the justice system across the population. There's evidence that 
you know, uh, somebody might not have touched any part of the justice system uh, for, you know, their whole lives, and then one bad thing happens, um, they lose the job or something, and then that triggers a whole other series of events, which means suddenly they're touching on loads of different parts of the justice system. So they lose a job, they get divorced, uh, they go bankrupt, um, they, they get in trouble with the, the criminal law. And if you can just avoid that first event or, you know, a, another part of government, you know, provide better services to make sure that all those terrible things don't happen, then that's helping those individuals, that cohort of people, but it's also helping the taxpayer as well because then you're not just trying to sort of... Um, deal with the aftermath of all these bad things happening but ministry of justice genuinely want to know at the moment all these uh, administrative data systems aren't linked so you have no idea whether it's the same people coming through different parts of the justice system or the same or or, or different people but does that answer your question <laughs> thank you and um, we've got two minutes left next set of questions been quite a gender imbalance in the questioners so far. So um, there's a lady here, a lady at the back, and then uh, the gentleman at the couple of rows in front as well. Angela Pober from the Pensions Dashboard part of the DWP. Um, have you thought about working with the previous presenter? Because if you did your job properly, he wouldn't have to do his. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> Uh, right at the back. Jen Person, Defend Digital Me. Um, what assessment have you done of the risks of public perception to the linkage of the National Pupil Database with census data? And I ask that because you mentioned operational use of data, and whilst the ADR does not use it for operational reasons, there are significant concerns in the education sector about the operational uses of the National Pupil Database, and they pose a significant threat to you. Thank you. And uh, the gentleman right behind you, Freddie, there, very quickly. Uh, Sam Gregory from PwC. Um, so kind of akin to the question before, is there a need for government departments to become uh, better at creating more similar day standards across departments um, so that more, so they're more collaborated and aligned for when you guys can do your work in a much more uh, kind of feasible manner? Thank you. So it's 30 seconds for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Angela first. Absolutely, I was thinking the same thing, so, so that's a yes. Um, to the public perception, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, and, and I, I agree this is a risk to our programme. If people don't understand, you know, a department may do things with data for operational reasons that we would never condone for research reasons, and the five says kind of protects us that researchers coming to us and using ONS's services can't do that type of work um, but I, I absolutely agree and that's part of the the public panels and the the uh, public engagement work that we're setting off um, so that there's a better understanding about that not just in the public but also the in government because you know a lot of our conversations start in government with you know they want to build, build an operational database and we're like no we're not going anywhere near that we're only you know, in the business of funding research and supporting research. And uh, the final one, Sam, uh, better data standards. I think this, this links to the, this is a big part of ONS's role in, in uh, the kind of statistics role. And I know they are doing a lot of work around this. That would obviously help. But with uh, some of the systems where the data just can't physically be linked and it's not in a, a fit state to be researchable at the moment, it's almost a kind of step before that. But I think that's the type of work that would have to be done when there's a new operational system uh, being built. So, for example, HMCTS are, are making all their court services digital. You know, I'd really hope that when... Um, that type of work's done, the data fees that come out do support um, valid research to be able to done uh, for the public good. Thank you very much. Okay. I think we've brokered so many data sharing uh, discussions in these events, we probably need a data protection impact assessment. Um, next up, we've got Graham.
Fraud is big. Fraud is really big. I mean, it's £48 billion pounds worth of big. It's a department, it's MOD. And it's so hard. Because governments, unlike any other part of the private sector, you can't take a private sector thing and put it into government. There's no single panacea, there's no cure that you can just apply immediately across the whole of government. There's no big solution for fraud. It's very complex. So, about four or five years ago, John Manzoni, CEO of government, stood up in front of a crowd of interested fraud people in government and said to them, bring your fraud projects, we'll work with you on this, we'll help you through it. And we were overwhelmed by the silence. Nothing. <laughs> and we were curious, we were curious, because fraud is big. So why were people not using data as part of addressing fraud? So we ran a survey, a couple of surveys, and we got some answers back. So what we found out is that some departments don't recognise they have fraud and have no analysts. Some departments recognise they have fraud and have no analysts. Some departments recognise they've got fraud and have analysts. And some departments don't recognise they've got analysts and don't recognise they've got fraud. So, DWPH must see, recognise fraud and have analysts. Um, there are other groups in that don't recognise fraud at all, and therefore have no need for analysts. We were looking at two groups, ones who recognised they had fraud but had no analysts to support the work, and those ones who had analysts, had recognised the fraud but couldn't quite bring the two together. So, we basically looked at what was happening within those two areas, and what we heard were three things. So, I can't say I want, can't share data, I won't share data. Um, well, I would if I could, and I will, but I'm just not sure how. So, what we did is we recognised there was little understanding of data as an asset in government. So, we had an organisational concept, we had a huge capability challenge of some people who should be using analytics to counter fraud, just not having the ability to do that. We had data not being recognised as an asset, people were not really understanding the value of data to counter fraud. And we had legislative challenges. So, what do we do about it? Well, we changed the law. So, <laughs> and there's no fraud anymore. Great, and go. Um, so, we introduced the Digital Economy Act. The Digital Economy Act gave an explicit power for departments subscribing to the act to share data to counter fraud. It got rid of those arguments people say, oh, the DPA stops me. It never did, it never would. It told you how to do it should you want to. But this, for the first time, it gave an explicit power, permissive, to allow data to be shared. So we get rid of those, why well, can't, so I won't. And we recognise there was no big answer. Um, government can't take a private sector solution and apply it to government. The fact that a bank or a credit card company or a finance company will look at you, risk you and say, oh, a bit risky, we can't touch you. If you are an unemployed fraudster, you are still an unemployed fraudster. We have to give you a benefit. We might understand the risk in doing that, but we still have to apply it. So what we did is we focused on specific fraud problems. We recognised there was no big panacea, no big solution. We developed small agile statistical pilots with departments, bringing together a community of people interested in tackling fraud. We developed an access to tools and capabilities to allow departments to do that, and we passed that learning on. So, we wanted to tackle those who said, well, I will, but I'm not sure how. So we put in place a small team of analysts and project managers within my group, so I run them. About four staff, we do seven to eight pilots a year, you're looking at our delivery from last year. Each one of these take about 18 to 24 weeks to run. So the Digital Economy Act took a process that if you needed legislation to share data to come to fraud, it would take you about two years to put that in place. The Digital Economy Act takes about six weeks, but keeps parliamentary accountability. A minister must approve that data share. We took piloting processes that, again, often would take a year and a half, two years, and we brought it down to 18, 24 weeks. The importance is we take a statistically significant sample, that's hard to say when you haven't got a dry mouth, um, and we find the fraud in the system. So we use that to find the fraud in the whole system, and then we look at, within the pilot, investigating the frauds that are there. So you can see that um, last year we found about £17.5 million pounds worth of fraud just in the pilots alone. A team of four people, seven pilots run throughout the year, across um, the devolved administrations, so Scotland's involved in it, Northern Ireland's involved in it as well. Um, six government departments involved in that. Um, we recognise within the system about £117 million pounds worth of fraud. So it can be done. Now, the next challenge we face is that, um, well, I would if I could. So we're in the game of fishing. We want to teach people to use data analytics to counter fraud. The challenge we have is teaching them how. So we developed a best practice guide. 
The best practice guide gives a workflow of how you tackle a counter-fraud analytical project. It tells you the processes to use, it tells you when to call in analysts. So the workflow is broken down to the stages you would ordinarily use within a process. There's a text block process, it talks about the people and the processes you would use to come to fraud. What we also did was we linked this with a capability matrix. So this told you at what stage to involve an analyst, what type of analyst you need, and what type of analytics you might want to apply at that stage. I, I don't want to use idiot's guide, but I'll leave that for you to judge. Um, we were, however, too successful. We found, in some cases, too much fraud. <laughs> Um, the challenge we have is that fraud in government can be quite expensive and you can't prosecute your way out of this problem. Although it's important for government, if you look at police forces and their priorities in local crime, it could be stabbings, it could be drugs. Fraud isn't high up the agenda quite often and it's understandable why it's not. It's not perhaps so much of a social problem. So for those departments who can't prosecute, there's a real challenge in finding it. So we're looking at a different approach. We recognise that you can't prosecute the of fraud. So we look at the focus on fraud prevention. We look at the focus on developing capability across government. Now, at this end, you get intelligence gathering, you get investigations. We have a lot of these people in government. DBP, HMRC, I think, have some region of three to 6,000 people involved in intelligence and investigations and the analytics behind that. What we don't have, and you see it in the banking sector and other sectors, is people in the end of data analytics and fraud analytics looking at fraud. What we've found is we've got stacks of economists, masses of them. We've got statisticians, we've got operational researchers. They do not point towards fraud. So, um, last year we used a profession, and what we're doing now is linking into that profession, and for the first time ever in government, we are creating a standard for counter-fraud analytics. So to finish, we talked about the data mindset. We talked about not recognising fraud as an asset. We've taken steps to challenge that. We've taken steps to give people the products to allow them to start to do fraud projects. We are developing government's capability. We're bringing them board the profession. We've given them a toolkit, which is the, business, the best practice guide, to start to develop this. We want to take it further. We've got a thought paper out at the moment where we've gone out to the public, to the private sector, to academia, and said, how can we address these next challenges facing government. How can we make sure we're doing it ethically? How can we access more data? How can we address data quality and improve government data mindset? Now, I'm happy to finish there ahead of time. Thank you, Graham. Um, next set of questions. We've got one up the door. We've got one down here. Uh, any others in the first batch? Great, let's get started with those two. Hi there, um, Andy Bennett, Register Dynamics. So we, we did some work with, the, with, with GDS and the Cabinet Office where we were trying to work out what the fraud rates were in services and we found that people were really hesitant to measure fraud because as soon as they measure it, it goes up and that bad, looks bad for them. So how do, you, how, 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 what, how do you deal with the social side of tackling fraud? How do you get people to engage with this and actually admit that they have any fraud at all in the first place or even look to see if they have any fraud? Thank you. And then down here as well. Thank you. Uh, I'm Joe Dilger, so Data Protection Officer, University of Winchester. Um, and uh, you mentioned uh, about the Digital Economy Act in terms of explicit power to share data within government. I wondered if there were still challenges for, for government, cabinet office and so on in terms of having data shared with government from outside government and whether you had a view in terms of ICO's new draft data sharing code of practice out for consultation at the moment, whether that would help in, in terms of clarity, in terms of data sharing, because from my perspective it does, in terms of making it clearer that it's a lot easier and safer where it's legitimate and reasonable to do so, for example, to share data with the police for law enforcement purposes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just this thing. Right, I'll totally slow you now and just waste some more time. <laughs> um, to come to your first point, so I think it's a very valid point. I work uh, as a small group within a much larger group, which is the fraud and area uh, within Cabinet Office under Mark Cheeseman. Um, there are other disciplines within that group, so um, government departments are required to report into us on how they're adhering to the counter-fraud standards. 
Um, government departments have to have a kind of fraud strategy and have to have an action plan to address the, the fraud that they should be recognising. So we are really through that group starting to change the mindset of government and saying actually finding fraud is a good thing. It shows you've got a grasp of your finances. It shows you're aware of the fraud that's happening there. Um, we know on average from the work that we've done and from the fraud measurement shown species within the other part of Mark's area that we do there, which looks at business, business processes and identifies what fraud may be, may be within the process, the departments should be finding about 1, 1.5 to 5 percent of fraud. And if they're not, the challenge is it's there, you're not finding it. Um, so we are starting to get that move. Um, there's another piece of work that Mark was involved in, which um, was about the bribery and corruption. Um, so under bribery and corruption, I'm not sure it's an act yet, Mark will give me a kicking on that one. Um, but uh, every department now has to have a senior civil servant who is responsible and accountable for within that department. So we're really starting to get our teeth into, you do have fraud, you will recognise it and you'll manage it. Does that answer your question? Okay, thanks much. Um, coming back to you is yes and yes. Um, I have to say, I think, I think I can say this. So I believe the code of practice that ICO are developing is quite closely tied in with the one that's developed in the back of the DEA. That actually what they saw was a lot of good practice. And I think there's been a lot of work with the DEA team and ICO in bringing together the ICO code of practice. I have never seen the DPA as been a problem for anybody. I've always seen it as an enabler to get fraud. People would say, oh, I can't, it's a DPA. And I've never taken that as an excuse. So I think clarity in the GDPR can only help us move towards better data sharing and more improved data sharing. Answer your question? Yeah, um, I, I think uh, there's not necessarily much clarity in the GDPR about data sharing. I think if you acknowledge your work, you can pull it out and yeah, in terms okay. of local basis for processing personal data. But I think the ICO's draft data sharing code of practice, even though it's a draft, it basically says this is a good summary from the ICO of the law yeah. on data sharing. And what, what we try and do with our work is we have a kind of fraud forum where we try and share the approaches that we're using. We try and share where someone has done a, a data share, um, understand the analysis that they use, understand the data they use, understand the value of that. And we also understand how the, the data sharing agreement would be set up and what challenges there were. So for us, it's also about building that platform upon which others can build new projects and new pilots, having accepted what's gone previously. Okay? Yep. Thank you. Uh, next set of questions. <laughs> Uh, one right at the back. Any more? Um, you've, got one, whole, you've got one, one right at 45 the front. Uh, hi, uh, Matt Kellogg from a different bit of the Cabinet Office. Um, as, I, I, as you said, and as I know, your work on Ford sits in a wider Ford area and, yeah. and, and uh, group. I, the, the numbers are sort of generally the case that error is actually a much larger sort of component of all our sort of Ford and error totals. But um, as I was just wondering, sort of, and this is obviously really important, but I wonder about how much learning is there that can be transferred across to that much bigger bit of sort of uh, the Ford and Error pile, in a sense, from, from the work you've been doing. Thank you. And we've got a question right down here in the second row as well. Uh, Stuart Holland from Equifax. Um, mine was on what comes next, so the thought paper is great. I've seen John Manzoni promoting it in Civil Service World. Um, which will increase the engagement. I just wondered um, what comes next in that program of work. Thank you. Uh, okay, to come to your point. Um, certainly through the work that we do, we, we see for and together. Um, the, the challenge you're probably aware of is that everything really sits in the atmosphere until you can prove intent. Uh, and therefore, we certainly just look upon it as one area of there's fraud and error going on here. Um, we would do work through the pilots. We do try and push it towards uh, identifying how much is actually fraud and how much is actually error. And we do that through the investigation and compliance piece, but often that's a much longer process. Um, again, working with other part of Mark's area, a lot of what you do to counter fraud will counter error. So we do try and work more broadly across and take the principles and learning we get from the fraud and look at actually can that help address the error within the processes, business processes that, that we see. Uh, most of the pilots that we are working on, although we focus often on fraud, and the DEA would have you focus on fraud, that's what it's set up for. Um, the learning there allows you to tackle the error that makes it in the system through the same process. So it, there's a lot of symbiosis between the two that sort of transfers across, um, just looking at time-wise. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, so for us, the, the thought paper is a start of a process. Um, it was designed not as a, a consultation, because actually what we wanted to understand was what were the particular issues. Um, the diagram I showed prior to this one, which I think was that one, gives you kind of break down the structure of the thought paper. Um, it's set up that way so people can go, actually, ethics is my thing, so I can raise a question of ethics, or the whole bank's my thing, or data quality is an issue, and I want to focus on that. Um, what we will do is we're waiting for the, um, the input from that. Um, I have to say I was, I was dismayed. I spoke to Sam Smith, um, who's someone in the audience. Yay, there's Sam there. 
Um, Sam was heavily involved in the DEA when it was developed. Um, we've had a lot of people come back from industry tell us we should do more to share data. Uh, and oddly enough, they've got the tools to help us. Um, what, what we haven't really heard from is the private sector, uh, sort of the public um, and academia. So I was quite glad to actually find Sam today, because um, Sam will be quite vocal. Uh, and we're pushing it out to see actually we want to hear from everybody. We want to hear what's right, what's wrong, what we can do. Once that comes in, we're going to compile it. We're going to have a look at what that says. Um, we've, we're going to set up a, a group, um, again, to work with us and understand what we do with it next. Uh, and then ideally, if we feel there is a motion that needs to be challenged more strongly or presented more strongly, we'll talk to the Minister about how we handle that and progress with it. Um, does, that, does that help? But the answer is we haven't seen what comes back with the thought paper yet. We don't quite know what we're going to do. But there's a process in place to take it further. Fantastic. Any more for any more? Fantastic. 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 23, 23. Um, Very quick question there. Sorry, we'll come to you next time. Uh, Jamie Patton, another bit of the Cabinet Office. I'm um, just wondering whether um, departments have the right financial incentives to effectively detect fraud and manage it. If they do and do it well, do they get to retain in their own budgets or does it go back to Treasury? So that is quite complex. It will depend upon where it's found within the budget. Um, in some instances, it goes back to Treasury. Um, in some instances, it's retained within the budget. So classically, we have problems where there isn't necessarily a loss of service. So some of the um, tenancy. Uh, I think express it this way, a local authority might have a certain amount to pay for five tenants, four of which are fraudulent. When they find those fraudulent tenants, they can then pay for another four tenants who aren't fraudulent. So that money doesn't necessarily come back, but it's not necessarily lost. I mean, an accountant would get, get me in that one, get into more complexities behind it. Um, there is certainly a challenge when we look at the um, business case of piloting. Um, it's very difficult to put a business case behind counter fraud, because uh, fraud prevention is quite a hard thing to measure. Um, at this moment in time, we are developing methodology um, within my team where we're trying to develop a framework for the benefits piece. We're trying to get through the HMT. It might not happen this year through HMT, where we can accept as a standard methodology for government that we can use for prevention pilots and kind of for pilots where the benefits can be recognised and realised. But it's a complex area that ties a whole into government finances, which is not my expert field. Graham, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
Well, uh, I'm going to focus on four reasons why it's a bad thing for the moment. Uh, so these are four uh, things that we have with our data. And I should stress, this is not all the data sets, but the, these things are present to some degree in a lot of our data sets. So timeliness is the first one. Uh, it takes a lot of time and effort for data to traverse this complicated web. Um, and often, it can only be obtained in the first place over here from some uh, data set that's outsourced that we only have some limited access to that we have to get only you know, a certain snapshot every few months or something. The point being, by the time it gets over here to the decision makers, often the data will be out of date or, or you know, not really uh, sufficient for the purposes of, that they need. This is especially true for operational data. If you're trying to make a decision on the ground, it's no good having data from four months ago often. So second thing, auditability. Uh, if your data is coming through this kind of complicated web, and a lot of this, at least you know, when teams pass each other, they're doing manual processing, uh, they're emailing it to each other. We often can't say exactly when the data was extracted or what's happened to it en route. Um, so you know, it's hard for us to audit that data or, or to feedback to find any, any errors in it. Uh, so consistency here. Uh, again, if it, as one data source starts, as one over here. By the time it goes through this, per percolates through this system, you've got several different data sets. It's saved in different places, often in local drives and so on. So you've got multiple copies. Trying to keep those consistent is basically impossible. And obviously, as an extra thing, having multiple copies of the data, even if they're all saved on our secure corporate network, it's not ideal for security to have lots of copies. And then we have reproducibility. So I guess all of these things come together to say we can't be confident of obtaining the exact data used to inform a previous decision, whether that's an operational decision or a policy one. If we want to say, well, how did we come to that decision? We have to hope that Bob's still got the data on his hard drive somewhere, otherwise. So again, it's not all the data sets, but these are problems we frequently come up with. And the solution to these problems is these guys, uh, the data engineers. Uh, and this is my team, so I guess I would say that. But uh, the question is, what do data engineers do? Well, what we do is we take this complica that complicated web and we replace it with, ideally, one single data pipeline. Again, what does that mean? Well, it says here we're using modern tools and technologies. What that basically means, we get the data from as close to its raw form as possible, ideally in some kind of automated feed. Uh, we timestamp it so we know when we got it. As soon as we get it in our area, we back it up so we've got an archive of the raw data. Uh, and then we basically, all the processing, all the cleaning, all the manipulation of that data then happens in code on a, uh, in our cloud platform environment so that we can say, well, we know this was the raw data from this particular snapshot and we've you know, used this version of code on it so we know exactly what's happened to it. Uh, and we can, get, we can then serve that. We move it onto like a service area, curated data area, and our analysts and data scientists can get it from there. So they pull it directly from there, either working in that same cloud environment or, or locally, um, depending on their requirements. So why is that good? Well, we can come back to our four things. Timeliness, suddenly now, because the data is processed automatically, it takes you know, a tiny amount, uh, hardly any time at all. Seconds in some cases, depending on the size of the data set. Um, and it can be up to date as decision makers need, assuming we can get that original feed. So we have things that go you know, daily, we can have jobs that run hourly that keep getting the latest version of this, this data. Um, we use uh, schedulers, obviously, so we can run this stuff overnight if we need to. Or we don't need to have a person there clicking go and waiting, you know, go and make a cup of tea while their computer locks up. Um, because our stack is uh, performant, we can do all that. And obviously, we can also do it all within our cloud platform environment. We can do it all in a secure way, which is great. So auditability, I said that our pipelines are made in code. They're version controlled using GitHub, so we know exactly what version of the code we've used, so it's, it's completely auditable. Uh, we can go back to GitHub and say, oh, look, this was a mistake here, and then we can correct that mistake and release a new version. Uh, consistency, uh, if the analysts and data scientists are getting the data from our curated area, we know, you know, everyone knows which version of the data they've got. It's stamped into the data itself what the provenance of that data is. So, you know, we know we've got consistency, um, but also, crucially, as I said, we back everything out, all the raw data. So we've actually got time-stamped historical versions of this as well. So if you want to find the data from four months ago or something, you can pull that, no problem at all. And you can run like, the latest version of the cleaning thing on that rather than the old one if you want to. Uh, so if we have, that comes to our reproducibility point, if we find some sort of error in our processing, not only can we rerun it on future versions of the data, but we can kind of backdate it onto the past versions as well and make sure that everything, the whole archive is correct, which is magic. Uh, so data engineers of the future, uh, data is not going away, as we've seen from, you know, this is the fifth data bytes and we're hoping for more. Uh, it's only getting more important. I think citizens will expect us to be able to use all this, uh, to improve our services by using operational data. And to do any of this accurately, sensitively, securely, or reproducibility, we're gonna, or reproducibly, we're going to need data engineers. So if you want to use machine learning in a complicated operational environment like a prison, you need good quality data. If you want to do rapid policy development with, you know, experimentation and evaluation, you need good data. If you want to link your data sets, 
as uh, Emma's kindly teed up, you're going to need good data to do it. So basically, as analysis moves into those cloud-based environments, data engineering skills are going to become more and more important. And you know, I can proudly say that I think in the Ministry of Justice, we're really um, doing some of the best work I've seen across government in this way, partly because I think our, our cloud platform is so good. Um, and we're using kind of technology that I think is as good as anything in the private sector. Um, so I'd say, finish by just saying, data engineering, I think, has the potential to revolutionize the way we use data in the Ministry of Justice and hopefully set the direction for, for government more generally. Um, so my last slide is just to say that when I've said that we're doing all this, obviously I don't do any of this. These people are the actual data engineers. Uh, and if anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thanks. Questions? Uh, we've got one there, one there, and one there. Perfect. Uh, Jenny O'Connor, GDS. Um, in the forthcoming national data strategy, with your data engineer hat on, what kind of, what were your kind of uh, topics to go in there for you? Thank you. We've got Sam over there. Sorry. Me again. Um, I presume that officially this government believes in the rule of law. Um, why are you laughing? <laughs> Who has responsibility for court data? Is it the judiciary, HMCTS, MOJ, etc.? And who is responsible for reviewing the arrangements for publishing judge, good judgments? Because I know it's in your team. And given, and to go back to the question I had earlier, which wasn't a, well, answered a completely different question, given there are ADR people in the room and it was an MOJ project, are your ministers, the judges, and project reviewers confident that MOJ? with no anonymization experience, was accurate in your application and didn't screw it up, and my FOI is two weeks before you have to reply to it. Uh, hi, Paul Maltby from the Ministry of Houses. So um, to what extent is that data engineering effort only possible after you fix some of the legacy issues for the core services, or is it possible to do it in a parallel way? Thank you. Uh, thanks. So some tough questions there. <laughs> uh, uh, so Jenny, uh, the National Data Strategy, I mean, it's not something I've actually thought about or prepared. So uh, speaking off the cuff, I think topics for data generally, I mean, I think we need to think about, I guess it comes into what we said about some data linking stuff. Quite often, the data that we collect is collected and used uh, in the public sector for operational purposes, and that's well and good. But I think, and in fact I've been saying in separate talks this week to people at MOJ, that we need to start thinking of the services that we provide also seeing the data that they're collecting as part of that service. And that service should be probably internal, but could also provide open data in some, some circumstances. So I think that seeing that data as part of services that are provided, particularly, in, I guess, in digital areas, because it's slightly easier to collect the data. But that would be something I'd really want to see pushed in, in any national strategy. Uh, Sam, was it? Yeah, I don't know specifically about the ADR uh, application and whether we screwed it up. <laughs> Fortunately, I wasn't involved directly in writing it. Um, so yeah, I take your point though, I guess your broader point about who takes responsibility for court data and how we're linking this stuff up. Um, I think it is a difficult area. I think we do have to be careful. Um, again, that's partly about having good oversight in place. Um, so we spend a lot of time and effort in my team trying to do as much of this possible, as much of this infrastructural stuff in terms of, I mean, to me, things like anonymization, um, retention, redaction, deletions, a lot of these things to me are um, technical challenges to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place that deals with this stuff, that we can define, like in a config, this is the rules for this data set and just have the machine do it for us. Because if you have people doing it, there's going to be mistakes. So I think that's the way I see the challenge as much as possible. And you know, I'm not going to tell you we've solved that. We're learning still. We're working out the best way of, of doing that stuff. Um, yeah, so I can't really speak to the legal side of it, but it's definitely a challenge that we're serious about. Um, and then uh, Paul said about the legacy issues. Uh, so a lot of these data sets that I've been talking about that we started working on are the kind of big legacy data sets. But uh, in the Ministry of Justice, we're looking to change the way that we serve a lot of this stuff. So we're moving from these big ossified monoliths to kind of microservices approach. 
And absolutely, that's going to be a big help, I think, to the data engineering challenge because well, it's kind of a help and a hindrance, right? On the one hand, the big services, it's a lot of data. They're hard to get to. You have issues of scale and so on. Um, but once you crack that, once you've got into it, you kind of got a solid pipeline and you know what's coming. Um, but the advantage of the microservices is they're a bit more flexible, um, which means that I think once you can get the access there, you can start, uh, I guess you can start saying, the analysts hopefully will have more input there to say what data they want collected and what will be useful and what insights can be got if we can just get that extra bit of data. So I think it's going to be really beneficial. Um, it should be more accessible, I guess, to my team anyway. Fantastic. Um, next set of questions. One there. Any more? And one at the back from Matt again. Hi, I'm Bethan from GDS. Um, so we've done a lot of work over the last year on the kind of innovation strategy and the government AI review as part of that. One of the big things that we found through this research was, you know, we often talk about how government needs more data scientists, but actually data engineers don't really get a lot of airtime, and actually they having data engineering skills in government is one of the key enablers to doing kind of machine learning, AI, predictive analytics. And so from your perspective, I'd be really interested to know what we could do to kind of improve the amount of data engineering talent that we bring into government. Mm -hmm. Again, the cabinet office. Um, I've heard lots about the analytics platform over, over the last couple of years. And it's really, as I think, it's a really interesting development. As you say, I think it's sort of probably at the cutting edge of like how analytical t developments in, in, in data management is going in government. Um, and not to say I would like, well, I would love analytical platform in a box that I could just pick up and, and deploy. Um, but I guess there's, the big question for me was, what's the? How did you make the business case for? Because there's, there's, got, there's a cost in this, setting this sort of stuff up. How did you make the business case for that at a time when we haven't always got the, the money for analysis and, and it's always that sort of like, oh, no, we don't need to put that in there. We, put, we should uh, devote the money over to the operational stuff. Thank you. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, so to Bethan, how to get more data engineers. Yep, I totally agree with you. Uh, there has been a lot of focus on data scientists in government and not much on data engineers. And certainly the journey that we and MOJ have been on has very much been that way around. We've had a lot of data scientists and so on, and we've done some really great work on that, and uh, data scientists are really valuable, speaking as someone who was in that team. <laughs> um, but what happens is, if you don't have the data engineering done, is you find you end up doing a lot of prototypes. You end up doing a lot of stuff on static data. You can show what could be possible, but when you want to start productionalizing that, you know, you hit into a barrier really quickly. Um, and that's the business we're in. You know, we're not in a business. We're not, if you're... Uh, I guess working in other environments, it might be okay to make some sort of prototype and then expect someone else to productionize it, but we are, in the end, providing services for people, and we need to be able to productionize them. So yeah, we need more data engineers desperately. Um, how to get them? Well, I guess that's one of the reasons why I'm here talking, right? To try and uh, encourage interest in data engineering as a field and make people realize that it is actually pretty cool stuff. Um, I mean, I think the, the name, you know, the, the, the idea people have of data engineering is not really an accurate one of what, what they think, you know, you'll just be working on some Oracle database somewhere or something, something horrible, um, which is not the case. Uh, how to get more? I think we need to be more flexible in how we recruit people. I think the, the recruitment process has changed, and I think that should hopefully make it a bit easier. But otherwise, it's a lot of outreach stuff. It's a lot of telling people, hey, there's really cool stuff going on in government, and we are actually doing stuff that's like solving challenges people don't know how to solve yet. And that hopefully should inspire people. I don't know. Um, and to Matt, yeah, so the analytical platform, I mean, it's, it's great. I guess I would say that. Uh, how we made the business case, I wasn't sadly involved right at the start, um, but I've seen some of the documents. I think like, the best case for something like the analytical platform is one of opportunity cost. Obviously, you can not spend money on a cloud platform, and you can carry on working in ways where you use your local machine and your secure image environment, and, but then analysts, are, a lot of them are using Excel uh, to do things. And again, that's fine. There's a lot of really great work done. But a lot of it, especially you know, it's 2019 now, a lot of this work starts to look like it's being done in spite of the tech and not being helped by the tech. And once you have examples of what cool things can be done elsewhere with this tech, it, becomes, it makes it easier to make that case. So I've been helping other departments. You know, how can they spread this word? And a lot of it, I think, is just examples. We happen to be lucky that we have the analytical platform. Well, I guess not lucky. People have done great work to get it going. Um, and I think, you know, the more we talk about this stuff, the more examples people can see. And it's a crucial thing is to have senior decision makers, right? Once they can see, hey, actually, if we can do this, we can start automating this statistical work or something, we can save FTE to do more interesting insights, and we can make a real difference in how the business is run, rather than, at the moment, having to hire lots of analysts to you know, count things, basically, and, and publish that every three months. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed.
as the only thing standing between you and wine and canapes, I will keep this very short. Um, we're hoping to be back um, for the next Data Bytes on Wednesday, the 2nd of October, but we are looking for sponsors. So if you're interested, please do come and speak to me afterwards, or to my colleague Pratesh, who'll put his hand up in the air. Pratesh is over there. Do come and say hello. Um, all that remains for me to say tonight is thank you to our sponsors for this evening, Equifax. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much to all of you for being such a great audience. You can applaud yourselves in a second, but please save most of your applause for our fantastic speakers tonight. Thank you very much indeed.